from Rice University here today to give us a <coughs> the seminar. Doug uh, graduated at Princeton for his uh, bachelor's degree and then uh, PhD at the Stanford working on the glasses and then also he lived three years apart and, <laughs> and then uh, he did his postdoc work at uh, the lab and working on a very short piece of this metallic uh, nanowires showing all these quantum coherences there. And then moved to the rise in uh, 2000, 2000, the year 2000, right? And uh, since then, he was, uh, has been working in the rise. Um, Doc has been known for many uh, pioneering work, especially, I think, the earlier work in the molecular electronics. He made a really important contributions. And he's the one also that carry over this molecular electronics for quite long, while the many people tend to kind of uh, just kind of move away. And uh, some of the really similar work is combining this um, uh, optical spectroscopy tools, Raman's with the transport, and that's a kind of uh, it's a wonderful work. And I've been seeing that he's been also working on the very other uh, nanoscale system, including something that we are going to hear from this one currently system in nanoscale. So, um, and also I have to mention that uh, Doug has been the chair as well as he's one of the really uh, power blogger, I would say that uh, he's, uh, the condensed matter block uh, is, has been uh, quite kind of, uh, popular among the many people, including uh, my students and myself, <laughs> reading the, enjoying the reading that. So I think without further uh, delay, no? Thank you, Go. Philip. Um, thank you very much for having me. I, I, I was saying to Philip earlier, I realized I don't think I've actually been to Harvard since my sort of pre-tenure world tour in 2005. Um, so I've got to find excuses to come back more frequently. Um, and despite the weather, it's a wonderful place, and obviously you're, you're <laughs> You have tremendous, you know, tremendous people, tremendous facilities. It's been great fun talking to everybody so far today. Um, I always, I like to to put this up because uh, 
if you actually go to the Piled Higher and Deeper website and you look at this particular comic, this is the one where like the advisor walks up and the apparatus breaks and he walks away and it fixes itself. If you look at, the, at this actual comic, it says with a little asterisk, thanks to Jeff at Rice University for submitting this idea for the comic. So this is actually directly inspired by me. Um, <laughs> I really did have this effect on his experiment. It was kind of funny. Um, so uh, as Philip said, uh, I'm going to talk to you today. You know, I've got a couple of different things going on in my group. Um, and one of the things that I've had an abiding interest in for, for a while is applying the techniques that we've all gotten good at in terms of making small scale structures and applying those to things that are sort of beyond the normal metals and semiconductors that we're used to. So I'm going to tell you kind of three vignettes today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about magnetism in, uh, in uh, intercalated uh, dichalcogenides, trans, uh, TMDs. Uh, I'm going to talk about a, 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 another uh, system that's closely related where we actually um, were able to identify uh, what sure looks like a quantum phase transition that hadn't been seen before. Uh, and then I'm going to conclude, or I'm going to, I'm going to, my third thing is going to be some work that's really in progress. So it's not necessarily ready for prime time yet, but it's, um, it's, I think it's pretty interesting and I'm, I'm pretty happy with how it's going so far. Um, not sure where I should stand and which one of these things I should talk to. I'll try and split the difference. Uh, as always, uh, you know, the people who really do the work, of course, are students and postdocs. Um, a lot of the, the first two things I'm going to talk about today, they were done by these two folks, but the, Will Hardy is the lead author on the papers uh, for the first couple of topics. And Pan Pan has been working hard on the, um, the, the, the last topic. And uh, so here's some relevant references. Um, and again, some, you'll, you'll, you'll hear some of these names throughout the, throughout the, um, the talk. Uh, actually, these folks, uh, Andre and Daryl, uh, were integral in some work we did with vanadium dioxide that I'm actually not going to discuss today. But they're, they're uh, terrific folks to work with. And the DOE paid for everything. Um, so let me give you a little bit of motivation and background uh, before we get too far here. And this is something I like to, I like to point out to, um, to senior undergraduates and graduate students because sometimes they haven't thought about it. It's really unreasonable that we're able to ignore the electron-electron repulsion as often as we are when you think about this. Um, you know, so in, in high school, you learn all about molecular orbitals, right? You learn about s orbitals, p orbitals, d orbitals. You learn about this entire atomic structure. And you just sort of take it and accept it when you learn about this in high school chemistry. Uh, but after you've taken undergraduate quantum mechanics, you should appreciate, wait a minute. If I have something like uranium, and I have 92 electrons that all repel each other, and they're all in this spherical volume of roughly, you know, four angstroms in diameter, isn't it? In this strongly interacting system, isn't it rather shocking that uh, that the level spectrum and the orbit and the wave functions look anything like what you'd get from the hydrogen atom problem? And of course, we know what saves you, right? What saves you here is the Pauli principle. It's this idea that as I drop additional electrons into this atom, and I think about, you know, I know we should really talk about totally anti-symmetric Slater determinants, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is that. When they teach it in high school, right, you're at, your electrons stack up because of the Pauli principle, the alpha process. They can't all fall down into the 1s state. And it's the growing kinetic energy as you throw these things in, and they have to occupy higher and higher kinetic uh, orbital states that, that makes the electron-electron interaction piece less relevant. And the same sort of thing happens often in periodic solids, right? So here's something that you would get if you just did like the chronic penny model or something. You can have uh, a periodic potential, and, and uh, here's the extended zone scheme, here's the, the folded zone scheme, and you have uh, an energy spectrum that has bands and gaps and bands and gaps, and you, if you want to understand the properties of aluminum or silicon or diamond, you can get pretty far by just doing the single electron problem and electron counting. Uh, now, this doesn't always work, right? I mean, you, you can do this, and of course, this is how you get, you know, in more complicated, this is, this is something like silicon, right? You can, get, you can get more complicated things. You can have heavy holes and light holes, and you can have uh, you know, diff different uh, valley degeneracies and pockets and so on in, 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 in reciprocal space. Um, but very often, we can get away with ignoring the electron-electron repulsion. Now, uh, this doesn't always work. So there is a whole wide class of materials, broadly called strongly correlated materials, where the electron-electron interaction and often not just that, but also the electron lattice interaction can be large enough that you get really strong corrections to what you would otherwise get from the single electron counting 
uh, system. Now, when, when does that happen? Well, that happens when uh, you don't have your electron density crazy high, so you're not, you're not throwing tons of things into a tiny, tiny volume. Uh, your, 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 your electrons are occupying states that are comparatively more localized. So that when they are more localized, that leads to a couple of things. That leads to narrower bands, right? And so if the bands are narrow, um, you know, imagine if I have a whole array of completely uncoupled atoms, the bands are incredibly sharp. It's just the atomic levels, right? Um, if the bands are narrow, then in some sense that means that uh, as a comparison energy scale, the interaction energy versus the bandwidth uh, can become big if your bands are narrow. We've all heard a lot about this with bilayer graphene, right? Where you can make very effective, very, very flat bands if you have a magic twist angle uh, such that the electron electron interaction can become uh, important relative to the bandwidth. Um, and also, when things are localized, it sort of means your kinetic energy is relatively lower. So these are all different flavors of the same thing. The most famous example of this is, is, is something called the Mott insulator. So I can have a system where here's a filled band, here's a partially filled band, and imagine this is maybe, um, this could be a copper oxide plane in, a, in a, the parent compound of the high temperature superconductors. This could also be something like the, um, it's a little more complicated than that, but it could also be something like the, the uh, iron, uh, the, some of the D bands associated with iron and something like Fe304, right? If you do simple electron counting with Fe304, you come to the conclusion that it should be a metal because your Fermi level should be in the middle of a partially filled band. In practice, the material is not a metal. Um, and so uh, the classic Mott insulator is this idea that the on-site repulsion, uh, even though maybe I've got, you know, say, singly occupied atomic sites, from the standpoint of quantum statistics, it's okay to doubly occupy a site. Um, the fact is that if the on-site repulsion is big enough, everybody locks in place. And I can open up a gap, and the size of this gap uh, is, is related to that, that on-site repulsion. So the system like that is a Mott insulator, and our, of course our atomic physics colleagues um, have been able to do you know, complete analogs to this thing um, using optical lattices, where instead of electrons, you're really talking about the, um, the positions of individual atoms. Uh, now, an interesting question is how do you quantify how correlated something is? I like to give this just as a little bit of perspective. Um, this is from a really nice paper that actually came out of Dmitry Basov's group, where what they did was, if you want to quantify how correlated something is, you want to compare, say, what the optical conductivity looks like from, you know, from DC up to you know, higher energies. You, you expect some kind of a Druda peak. If you have, if you have uh, free carriers that are able to easily move around, you expect some kind of Druda-like conductivity. And so what you can do is you can actually measure the optical conductivity and compare to what you would expect from a non-interacting electron theory, right? So this ratio that he likes to talk about, this K, is some sort of integrated uh, uh, spectral weight of the Druda peak uh, of the, the actual thing, rel the actual measured thing relative to what you'd expect from free electrons. And what you find uh, is that in systems like uh, silver and copper, this ratio K is basically one. So you really, really, it, it does make sense to think of these things as, as, as in this metric, as pretty uncorrelated. Um, vanadium dioxide in its metallic state is somewhere at around 0.5, and that correlates with the fact that it's a rather strange metal. Um, uh, it, it, at high temperatures, VO2 is a metal, and, uh, but it's a metal that seems to violate the yaffe regel criterion, so it's got a peculiarly high resistivity. Um, and then you've got systems down here in sort of the, the, the really more correlated limit that are things like these cuprates. Um, interestingly, the, the, like the iron nictides are somewhere kind of in the middle. Um, so this is a way, one way of, 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 of quantifying how, uh, how correlated these things are. The idea is that what the spectral weight that would have been in the Druda peak is somehow transferred up to higher frequencies. You're sort of kind of gapping things out at low energies. Um, and so why do people care about these correlated things? Again, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with the basic idea. Very often, uh, when interaction effects are important, uh, you can have lots of competition between different candidate ordered states, right? So here's YBCO, and, and you, know, you, you know this idea that in things like the cuprates, you can have antiferromagnetism, you can have charge order, you can have you know, other possible phases going on in addition to superconductivity, right? And uh, in things like the manganites, you can have all kinds of stuff, ferromagnetic metal, charge ordered state, orbital order, you can have all kinds of interesting things going on. And of course, physicists like it when there's all kinds of competition between ordered states because um, from the fundamental science side, it's very interesting. On some level, you could argue the mission of condensed matter physics is to enumerate the possible collective states of electrons. That's one way to think about hard condensed matter. Um, 
And also, if you ever want to make the argument that these things are going to be technologically interesting, when you've got competition between different phases that have dramatically different properties, you could imagine making very interesting active materials. And, and you know, when we talk about superconductivity, boy, wouldn't it be great if we could have room temperature superconductors with useful properties, things like that. So what could you do with nanostructures? Why would you want to play with these things on small scales? So there's, you know, this is kind of my, my quick um, summary of why this might be interesting. So first of all, often this is vanadium dioxide breaking up into metallic and insulating domains as it goes through its phase transition. Often materials have physically interesting intrinsic length scales. And you want to probe them on those length scales. So the folks here who do scan probe microscopy know all about this. Um, you know, that, that's a clear interesting thing you can do. Um, another thing you can do that I think is, le this is related to some work we did almost 10 years ago now um, on, on Fe304, which I'd mentioned before. Um, something that's not always appreciated, you can, when you, if you can make nanostructures, you can tell the difference between things that cost energy and things that cost electric field. So this is an example of a charge ordered insulator. And uh, at low bias, it's an incredibly good resistor. And this is this Japanese group, um, uh, you know, a long time ago now, they did something like apply 1,000 volts across a millimeter crystal of this stuff. And when you apply a kilovolt across a millimeter of this stuff, it becomes a lot more conductive. And when you take the voltage away, it becomes insulating again. And, and, and unlike some of these resistive switching materials, it doesn't seem like you're actually irreversibly destroying the material when you're doing this. So here's a question for you. Is this change in state between a resistive state and a conductive state happening because your electrons have 1,000 volts at their disposal? Or is it happening because you're applying an electric field of 10 to the 6 volts per meter? Right? Are you getting some kind of breakdown because you're tilting everything by applying a 10 to the 6 volt per meter electric field? Well, if you could make a device that was a micron long, you can get the same electric field with a volt. So if this, if this physics happens at a volt in a one micron device, then you know it's electric field driven, not necessarily energy driven. Um, spoiler alert, that is basically what happens. It is actually an electric field thing. Um, I don't know about this exact material, but there are other materials that are like that. Um, also, you can do field effect experiments. I think a lot of people here are familiar with this idea of ionic liquid gating, where if I, you know, if I, if I make structures that at least in one dimension are thin, I can imagine doing the field effect, and I can imagine changing the electronic population at nominally fixed disorder rather than doing chemical doping. Right? That's another sort of thing you can do. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting things you can learn about contacts. Uh, so here's you know, people looking at the fractional quantum Hall effect. You'll see this picture again later, um, where, where, where you can do tunneling experiments uh, from one edge state to another via the, fractional, the correlated fractional quantum Hall liquid. That's quite interesting. Um, this is some work we had done back in the day on magnetite, where actually um, usually people try and avoid worrying about their contacts altogether if they can. But it turns out that there are times when contacts can actually teach you stuff about what's going on in the material. And again, this is this idea, this is, gets back to this idea about applying large biases. You can look at systems driven out of equilibrium. It's pretty hard to look at a bulk material driven out of equilibrium. Um, I guess you know, lately there's been a lot of work on optics, right? pump probe spectroscopies to drive materials out of, systems out of equilibrium and look at them on short time scales. But there's a way you can actually do this uh, with electrical bias as well. Okay? So why, is, why haven't people flocked to this? What is hard? Right? What's the problem? And again, I, I, having talked to people uh, during the day today, I realize now that, that a large portion of you already know what I'm about to tell you. Um, so it's really, you know, this is a typical bulk sample. I'm pretty sure this is samarium hexaboride, if I recall correctly, um, uh, which, which, uh, which Crystal I grabbed from the literature here. But, you know, it can be really hard to understand the strain and the chemical composition of these correlated materials uh, unless you prepare them just right. Um, and another issue is if you want to do all the nice lithography stuff that we know how to do uh, on semiconductors and metals in terms of patterning, uh, it can be very, very tough to get things that remain chemically robust, right? I mean, you know, all of you in this room who struggle uh, with working in a glove box to put contacts down and encapsulating things so that trace humidity does not destroy your samples, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and then the other issue, again, does become the need to actually really have well-defined interfaces and contacts. Um, in things like silicon and gallium arsenide, to some extent, uh, you know, there's a, sort of, we all know there's kind of a black art for how you make con ohmic contacts to some of these systems, right? Uh, the, the, the 
system situation can get very, very tricky if you have correlated materials and that are complicated where perhaps oxygen plays a key role in the stoichiometry of the system. You really have to worry about how you make contact to these materials if you want to get robust results. So that's kind of my motivation, right? Let me tell you the first story here. Let me tell you about this material, um, iron intercalated tantalum disulfide. So the point of this story is to, is to, is to show you, um, it, this is an example of looking at a material both on the bulk and on the small scale and doing the comparison and learning something from it. In, a little, in some sense, it's almost a null experiment because what I'm going to show you is this material has a peculiar property and it looks exactly the same or very, very close on small scales as it does on big scales. And so you might think to yourself, well, that's not very interesting. But you'll see that this actually constrains the mechanism for what can be going on. Um, not everyone appreciates it, but TMDCs uh, are, you know, they're having at least their second, if not their third boom in the history of condensed matter physics. These things have been around for a long time. Um, here's some sampling of papers of people actually looking at iron intercalated tantalum disulfide uh, going back to 1975. People like Stuart Parkin and Richard Friend in 1980, right? I mean, you know, th this, is, this is old stuff, right? Um, so what does the material look like? Uh, so the material in question, it's basically 2H tantalum disulfide. So you've got the, these uh, trigonal prism uh, uh, sulfurs around a, uh, around a tantalum uh, atom in the, in the uh, unintercalated stuff. And when you intercalate it, iron goes between the layers. And the thing it's being, that's different now than what was being done in 1975 or 1980 is that growth methods. So my colleague, Amelia Morishan, has figured out how to grow very large single crystals that are very high quality of this material. Okay. Um, and so what's interesting is that you can imagine sticking all kinds of stuff between the layers of these TMDs. Um, you know, people do all sorts of things. There's two particular commensurate fillings that are nice, that are very stable, very well defined. One is the iron a quarter tantalum disulfide, um, and another is the iron a third tantalum disulfide. So these things are magnetic, they're metallic, and both of them, and they're, when I say they're magnetic, I mean they're ferromagnetic. And they're, it's local moment ferromagnetism. So basically, the, 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 it's the D, uh, the D electron, uh, one of the D electrons on the iron uh, is, is the operative one here. Um, these things actually end up being in a high spin state because of the crystal fields. And there's still a bunch of debate about, uh, and this is actually, on some level, this is really, really where the correlations come in. Um, there's a significant orbital moment contribution to these things, as well as the local, moment, the local spin degree of freedom. Spin orbit coupling is important. So it's, you know, these, are, these are challenging materials to understand. Um, so uh, this is from an, actually a recent paper by Jan Musfeld's group. Um, th this is DFT that they throw in there. But if you want to understand how charge is distributed, so if you have the iron a quarter, what you find is that charge in the, uh, the plane where the irons are is, is distributed in sort of a Kagame lattice kind of arrangement. And, it, it, and in, the, in the case of the, um, the, uh, the iron a, th a third, it's more of a honeycomb type arrangement. So this, is magnet th this iron a quarter is ferromagnetic, and the TC is about 160 Kelvin. Uh, this is also ferromagnetic. The TC is more like 90 or a little lower. Um, and also, the anisotropy of these things is quite remarkable. So they're really like, you can think of them very Ising-like. The spins really like to be aligned, along, aligned or anti-aligned with, aligned with the C-axis. Um, here's some work actually from Joe Chikelsky, uh, who is now at MIT, um, uh, uh, showing some measurements on, on, on some of the first really nice high quality single crystals of these things, where, uh, also grown by my colleague, um, where you know, here you are, here's the resistivity, and when you go through TC, uh, the resistivity drops quite a bit, right? And this is, this is the freezing out of spin disorder. So above TC, the spins can be fluctuating all over the place. Below TC, you've got uh, the freezing out, the gradual freezing out of spin disorder, and, 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 and essentially you're left with a resi residual resistivity down here somewhere. Um, the anisotropy of these things is quite remarkable. Here's magnetization on a big crystal, uh, and what you see, this is iron a quarter. And what you see is this incredibly square hysteresis loop. Um, from the standpoint of actual magnetic anisotropy, these materials are very similar to what you would see in the rare earth magnets. They're really anisotropic. They're, they're very similar to what you'd see in something like samarium cobalt or ne iron, neodymium iron boron. Um, the, of course, they're not that technically useful because the TC is so low. Right? But interesting to think about. OK, so 
Here's what you get if you look at the magneto resistance, the magneto transport at x equals a quarter. So if the magnetic field is, a, is along the c-axis, um, you see some kind of little butterfly-shaped hysteresis loop as you go down in temperature. You know, right when you go through TC, the shape changes. You see this butterfly hysteresis loop developing. Um, and the magneto resistance, this is, everything's multiplied by 100 here, right? So the magneto resistance is on the order of a percent. You know, not very big. Um, and if you do the magnetic field in the plane, again, you see, you see some, you know, on the order of a couple of percent, a few percent, um, and the shape looks quite different. So the fact that these things look very different is, again, it's a signature of the anisotropy. So if that was the whole story, then I would stop here and go on to the next topic. But that's not the whole story. Um, what you find is uh, you can grow stuff at different compositions. You can vary the amount of iron inside the material. And so here's a bulk, big bulk crystal. Here's an exfoliated piece that's actually not very thin. We had a really tough time getting this stuff very thin. The iron makes the layers really want to stick together. So this is, on the, this is tens of nanometers thick, um, which is why it looks so uh, bright uh, in this micrograph. Um, here's the comparison of resistance, resistance versus temperature for the bulk and the exfoliated thing, and they really lie on top of each other, right? Um, again, the spin, you know, the TC, and this is, this is X of about 0.28. Notice that only going from a quarter to 0.28, TC has fallen quite a bit, right? You're no longer, if I, took the, if I take the derivative of this curve, I can see, really see where the transition is. It's around 90 Kelvin. Um, so, okay, so you've really hurt the magnetism a little bit by, by you've hurt the stability, if you will, of the, of the ferromagnetic state. Um, but it still seems to have all the anisotropy and everything. What's surprising is, here's the magnetoresistance of the bulk and the, uh, the exfoliated piece. And this time, I'm not multiplying the resistivity, the change in resistance by anything. The magnetoresistance of this stuff is on the order of 80%, okay? Um, that's really, you know, 70 to 80% at low temperatures. That's big, right? If you recall, giant magnetoresistance is typically 10 to 30%. So, you know, we've kind of run out of superlatives in the magnetoresistive world. Um, we're, we're calling this like whopping magnetoresistance in the lab, but we did, that did not make it into the paper. Um, and the interesting thing here is that you see the, you know, everything looks very similar in the exfoliated piece as it does in the bulk. One, one thing to note, notice how in the bulk, these um, transitions are incredibly sharp. They're a bit more rounded in the, um, in the, uh, in the, the small flake. Um, you can do anomalous hall, right? And again, you see, uh, and I'm, you know, I, I did not bother to show, we couldn't do magnetization on the little flakes because you don't have enough signal. But um, uh, magnetization in the bulk really does look a lot like what you see in the anomalous hall. It all, that all kind of makes sense. The magnitude of the anomalous hall conductivity is or not, almost all resistivity rather is rather large. Um, these are tough measurements to do, by the way, because the, the magnetoresistance itself is so huge that if you get the, the li alignment wrong, uh, you pick up a big longitudinal magnetoresistance contribution on top of the anomalous hull. So you gotta be careful about that. But again, what you see is that, that you know, everything looks um, very similar between these two things. Um, the reason these things are so sharp, we now think, uh, in the bulk, is it's actually a thermal effect. So what happens is once you really start coercing the spins, you end up dumping a bunch of thermal energy into the lattice, and we think the thing kind of runs away and immediately you know, flips, things immediately flip. Whereas um, in the thin crystal, uh, we think that, that the heat can get out pretty effectively. So you don't see this you know, sudden kind of thermal avalanching. So, one of the, so, so what I've shown you is things look very similar between the bulk and the little flake. Um, why do you care about that? Well, one possibility when we were first looking at this was what, what could give you big resistances? What can give you big magneto resistances? It could be domains. It could basically be giant magneto resistance. If you have a domain that's oriented like this and a domain that's oriented like this, you could really get this mismatching density of states thing, right, that would give you GMR. So uh, it's interesting to note we have not done magneto optics at a bunch of different concentrations, but generically at, at a quarter and a third, People have done magneto optics, and what you find is that the domain size, so this is like a millimeter, right? So the domain size is kind of tens of microns, 10 microns, right? So the fact that you actually see the same magnetoresistive response in few micron samples as you do in millimeter samples tells you this isn't, you know, you, if, 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 if you were seeing effects due to individual domains, you'd expect to see some kind of discrete switching of some sort, and you don't see that at all. 
So it seems like this has something intrinsic in the material, at least on very small scales, not, not macroscopic domains. So what do we think is going on? Ah, sorry. This is, I, I should have explained. This is, this is, this is uh, cranking up the magnetic field and getting you know, closer and closer and closer to the coercive field. So you're, this is really, you know, this is, this is, this is magneto-optic response. So you basically, you're, you're, you're breaking the system up into domains. And at some point, you really coerce everybody. So if you kept going, this whole thing would turn black. Um, so here's what we think is going on. Uh, at incommensurate filling, right, um, there are going to be some local moments. So we know local moments, the fluctuations of local moments give you a contribution to the resistivity, right? You see that just in R versus T. Um, what we think is going on here is that moments that are either at defect sites or next to defect sites, they're going to be easier to flip. They're going to be easier to coerce. So as you approach, as you ramp up and approach the uh, coercive field, you're going to flip a bunch of those, and you're going to get scattering off of those what are now effectively defect sites because of spin orbit effects. right? And uh, if that's true, then you should only really see these things uh, when you're at some funny incommensurate filling level. And uh, in a follow-up paper, um, Shiwei, the, the, the student with uh, Professor Morishan, grew a bunch of things at different compositions, which is a laborious task, but did it. And what you find, uh, the red is the magnetoresistance data. What you find is, yeah, the magnetoresistance really does have a minimum, a very sharp minimum near a quarter. It has a, it has a, we, they believe it's got a minimum near a third. And in between, it's at these incommensurate levels where the magnetoresistance um, actually gets, uh, gets big, right? So the thing about this that's cute is that by comparing the bulk and the small scale devices, you actually think you constrain the mechanism of what this funny effect is. And the other thing that I hope people, you know, this paper kind of has not been, has not made much of an impact uh, in terms of citations and stuff. I hope people appreciate, like, this might be a route to designing very magnetoresistive materials, right? If you, if you combine local moments, spin orbit coupling, and the ability to engineer um, the response of the local moments to external fields, you might be able, you might have a way to make materials deliberately that have very large magnetoresistances. So I guess people would wonder, are the irons at X equal to regular Yes. The irons at X equal a quarter and at X equals a third, the irons are arranged in a regular fashion. And so it's an interesting question as you go away from X equals a quarter, does it look more like a quarter with some fuzz or does it look more like a third with some other kind of fuzz? And actually electron diffraction on our 0.28 samples, they look a little bit more like a third than a quarter, which is kind of interesting since you're a lot closer in composition to a quarter. It kind of looks like you took the, the, the one third arrangement and made a bunch of defects in it. Right, um, but yeah, it's a very interesting point. Okay. So in yes. This, in this case, then, can we control for this little bit that we don't see so much too high to be applicable in real world situations, putting aside the quantum? Well, and some it depends what you want to do, right? I mean, for 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 rare earth, if you wanted to make something that operated at room temperature, so okay, it depends what you want to do. If you want to if you want to use the anisotropy for something useful, you actually want the coercive field to be really big. If you want to do it for magnetoresistive, like data, you know, uh, I, uh, spintronic applications, then you probably do want the coercive field to be small. That's right. So if you actually want a high coercive field, then what is the benefit of this particular layer of material over, say, TMR materials like manganites? Well, the manganite, so the manganites have a, uh, the manganites are, are, are there, you, the reason you get the magnetoresistance is that you're actually switching between phases, mm -hmm. right? Whereas here, you're not, you're just manipulating, you know, you're staying in the same thermodynamic phase. You're just manipulating the arrangement of the spin. So they're rather different. Yeah, they're rather the different things. Yeah, 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 yeah. CMR materials are, you know, CMR materials are prickly, and they, you know, they're, they're affected by strain and things like that. So. Okay, um, second thing, trying to keep an eye on the time here. Let me talk to you about vanadium-5 sulfur-8. Um, again, the students and some of the students in the room will probably appreciate um, what we were trying to do was to work on vanadium disulfide, okay? Uh, and it turns out there's all this interesting theory, um, invo some involving strong correlations, that, for example, monolayer VS2 is supposed to be of half metal, right? Um, my colleague, Jun Lo, uh, he had a student where they were trying to grow stuff, and what they found was they were actually able to grow, the vanadium sulfur phase diagram is rather complicated, and they were able to grow um, V5S8, 
which you should really think of as V a quarter VS2. So just like the intercalated, iron intercalated TMD I showed you a minute ago, you can think of this as a, as a, um, as a now this, this one is um, a, a 1T VS2 instead of a 2H VS2. Uh, but so there's vanadiums that live uh, in these calcogen, you know, TMD layers. But there's a whole second kind of uh, vanadium site, a whole third, I guess, really a third kind of vanadium site. There's a kind of vanadium site that lives in the, the intercalants. So it's vanadium a quarter between the VS2 layers. It turns out this stuff we were uh, we, we we realized was known. So the Japanese discovered this in 1975. It's an antiferromagnet. It's a metal. Uh, so the idea is that you've got metallic conduction in these layers, and then you've got these local moments again in the in the uh, in the uh, the intercalated vanadium layers. And this little it's hard to see the arrows. The spin structure that's drawn in here that's actually what people infer from you make a big crystal of the stuff and you do neutron scattering. And so that's what the spin arrangement looks like in the antiferromagnetically ordered state. Um, and again, you know, here's the old data resistivity. It's metal. It's a metal. You cool down, cool down, cool down. And when you go through T Nal, which is about 30 Kelvin, uh, you again see the freeze out of the spin fluctuations. OK. So um, antiferromagnets can be tough to deal with because it can be very hard, particularly on small scales. How do you know you have antiferromagnetism? Um, ferromagnets, you can at least, you know, magneto optics are much easier on ferromagnets. Antiferromagnets are pretty tough for this. Uh, it turns out we get lucky. Um, there is a spin flop transition in this material. So the easy axis for the magnetization is close to the C axis. If I apply a big magnetic field along C, uh, the energetically favorable thing to do once you get up to about 4 Tesla is for the spins to flop over into the plane or close to into the plane and be canted. Um, and the, the magneto resistance for the field along this way has a big feature at around 4 Tesla that is, the, that, that is a signature of the spin flop transition. Now, why does it look like that? I have no good intuition for this. There is a theory paper that this is part of uh, where they, they, they purport to have an explanation for why the magneto resistance has this shape. I don't really understand it. Uh, it does, it's not at all obvious to me. But the bottom line is the spin flop transition is a way of saying, hey, from the, resist from the magneto resistance, you can tell that you have an antiferromagnet in this material. OK, so one thing that was lingering out there in this material, so this material was looked at pretty intensely in the late 70s and early 80s and then pretty much put aside. right? Um, and one lingering thing was out there in the literature was that people did take this stuff up to pretty high fields at a big magnet lab. And they found uh, some weird hysteresis at around 18 Tesla at 4 Kelvin. And they pretty much wrote this up. They were looking at the magnetic properties. And they wrote this whole thing up. And they said, you know, we have no idea what that is. And that was basically it. So um, you know, uh, so here's something in the, yeah, it's in the magnetization. They basically take the slope and you see that. So mysterious MH hysteresis at 4K between 16 and 20 Tesla. So here we come. Uh, this kind of thing should look familiar to a lot of people in this room. Um, oh, I should have said, I mentioned the art of making contacts. In the iron and disulfide, we ended up using iron as an adhesion layer for our electrodes. If we tried to use like chrome gold or Thai gold or something, we just never got good reliable contacts. But iron, a tiny bit of iron seemed to work if we were careful. In this stuff, we used vanadium as an adhesion layer. I wish I could tell you that we had tremendous, incredible insight as to why this would, I mean, it, you know, it seems plausible, right? But it actually worked. Um, so yeah, you can do lithography. You can, you, can, you can have these things. These are not exfoliated. These are as grown on some substrate, grown by CVD. And we looked at things, um, thicknesses down to on the order of, of 10 nanometers. Fortunately, this seems to be a comparative, both the previous one and this one seem to be comparatively stable. Moisture does not destroy these samples. If you store the samples somewhat sensibly, you don't even have to encapsulate them. They seem to last. Okay. Um, so what do we see? So here's samples of a variety of thicknesses, and here's re resistivity versus temperature. And with all of these things, what you see, first of all, you see the residual resistivity ratio gets worse and worse as you make the stuff thinner. So this, this could be deep and profound, or it could have something to do with boundary scattering. Okay. Um, and you can still see. In here, the, the red points, I apologize for how crowded this figure is, the red points are the derivative of the red solid curve. Again, you can see a big transition uh, where, there, where there's a kink where the spin fluctuations start freezing out. Okay? And uh, so you can, you, know, you can really see TNAL. Uh, 
Um, here's the weird bit. Here's the weirdness. Let's look at magnetoresistance. C axis H, magnetoresistance. Here's a pretty thick device. And uh, it looks pretty conventional above TC. Um, uh, this is sort of what people sort of expect to see. And then below TC, you see the spin flop thing. But the really weird one is this kind of uh, teal curve. It's got hysteresis in it. That was weird, right? In fact, if you look very carefully as a function of temperature, whoops, um, just below TC, you start seeing this spin flop thing. You see this hysteresis appears. And it moves out to higher and higher fields very rapidly. Going from 31 Kelvin to 28 Kelvin, it's gone from close to zero field out to beyond 9 Tesla. And you need a bigger magnet to keep seeing it. Odd. Um, surprising. Uh, so we almost missed this, I should point out. Like we were very coarsely looking as a function of temperature at the magnetic resistance because it takes a while to take the data. So if we, had, you know, if this had happened basically not close to some multiple of five Kelvin, we probably would have missed it and not written the paper. Um, you can look at the field in the plane, same material, same sample, the field in the plane, and the same thing happens. There's hysteresis over the same field range over the same temperature range, right? So that's kind of weird. You get this hysteresis whether the field's along the c-axis or whether the field's in the plane. Um, you can look at the Hall effect, and you see some funky kink in the Hall effect uh, at the spin-flop transition. I don't know how, how, how to interpret that. I'm just showing it to you for completion. This stuff is n-type um, based on the slope. Um, so here we go borrowing our colleague's 14 Tesla magnet. And you can see, yeah, here's that hysteresis. And oh, look at that. It goes all the way out. And in fact, it runs out of the edge of the 14 Tesla magnet by the time you get down to 20K. Right. And again, here's the, the in-plane stuff. We couldn't do the, we didn't have the rotator for their setups. We couldn't do the in-plane at the high field. Um, so this is all 66 nanometer thick material. That's pretty much bulk. Right. Uh, let's look and see what happens uh, if I make the material thinner. So this is 24 nanometers thick. Still see the spin flop signature in the H parallel to C direction. And it, well, it might be some hysteresis, hard to say. With the field in the plane, you can still see some kind of hysteresis over the same sort of temperature range. Um, if you make the thing really thin, 12 nanometers thick, and the 10 nanometer thick one we looked at looks basically the same. There's still some feature here that seems to indicate that you've got that some remnant of that spin flop is still around. So it looks like the material is still antiferromagnetic. The field where it happens is now 3 tesla instead of 4. Um, no readily detectable hysteresis at all. So somehow the hysteresis is going away. Um, the TNAL also gets a bit suppressed, by the way, when you make the thing thin. So let's plot the data in an interesting way. Okay? Let's plot T over TNAL on the y-axis, field on the x-axis, and the width of the horizontal error bar is the width of the, history, the measured hysteresis loop. All right. So what you find is that, you know, so if I allow TNAL to vary from sample to sample, because as they get thinner, the TNAL gets lower, right? Um, you, these things really do lie along some, you know, some curve, some, some, some family of, uh, of things. So what do we think is going on there? What we think is at low fields, the stuff's an antiferromagnet, because we can still see the spin flop transition. At high fields, I think we're killing the antiferromagnetism. When you're close to TNAL, it doesn't take much, you know, when, when, the anti, when the antiferromagnetic phase is barely the, the favored phase, it doesn't take that much energy uh, input from the magnetic field to coerce you out of it, right, to, to destroy it. But when you're at lower fields, it, you know, this is a stable phase, it's hard to kill it. Now, we can argue about whether this is a paramagnet or technically a ferromagnet because you've, kind of you've kind of coerced everybody. But we think that's what's going on. Uh, it, seems to, it seems to be. It seems to be. In, well, in bulk crystals, it saturates. In the little, in the little crystals, I don't know what it does, but I, th I think so. Um, this red point down here, by the way, is the mysterious hysteresis in the, the older Japanese magnetization work. So it lands like right where you'd expect it to. All right. So um, it sure looks to me like there is some kind of a quantum phase transition between, you know, as a function of this as a control parameter, between an antiferromagnetic state and, again, either a paramagnetic state or a ferromagnetic state. 
uh, at t equals 0. It just you know, seems to extrapolate to finite field. Now, um, this was up here with the hysteresis. It's clearly a first order metamagnetic transition of some kind. Uh, interesting when you make it thin that the hysteresis goes away. That could be a sign that the thing becomes more second order rather than first order. Hard to know. I now realize in hindsight that, that what we really ought to do is actually get more of these samples and go and look at transport out here, right? Go to the magnet lab and look at transport at 18 Tesla as a function of temperature and see if you see anything that looks like quantum criticality. If it's a first order transition, you won't. You shouldn't see any critical fluctuations. But if it's a, if it's a, if it's a continuous quantum phase transition, you should see something interesting out here. So this is, again, this is an example where, where um, by having the small samples and, and being, able, being able to play with them, uh, we were able to see stuff that hadn't been seen before. OK, third and final topic. I can see it's late in the afternoon. Everyone's fading a little bit. Um, this is an ongoing project. And so I don't have any deep conclusion to show you. But I'll show you some inter what I hope is some interesting stuff. At least I hope the motivation interests you. So what are strange metals? So there, there's various kinds of things where that's, that, that, that at first glance seem to violate Fermi liquid theory, which is our standard understanding of metals, where the low energy excitations of Fermi liquids are these long-lived quasi-particles that, that are very well defined. Uh, they have charge minus E if they're electron-like, and they, you know, they, live, they live a long time. They're well distinguished from the Fermi surface. Um, so you can have bad metals where the resistivity is bizarrely high. And like I said, we've done some work on uh, vanadium dioxide where if you dope it with hydrogen, you can actually stabilize this weirdly metal weird metallic state down to um, pretty low temperatures. Um, and then there are strange metals. In strange metals, the, the temperature dependence of the resistivity uh, is linear over a very, very broad range. Right? And the, another, another characteristic of these things seems to be some funny separation of, of, time, uh, of, of, of scattering times between the, uh, the longitudinal resistivity and the transverse resistivity. So this thing seems to scale like T squared, which is kind of what you'd expect for a Fermi liquid, whereas this one scales kind of linearly in T, uh, which is what happens in these strange metals. So well, what's going on here? All right. Um, one of the questions is, what are the low energy excitations that carry current in these systems? Should you think of them as some complicated many-body thing, or are they rather quasi-particle-like? So the, the tool we're going to use to try and look at this is shot noise. All right. What is shot noise? Well, shot noise is this idea that um, charge comes in discrete chunks. And I can imagine making a structure where I can look at the, um, the arrival rate of charge. Right? And this was first really analyzed in some detailed way uh, by Schottky, like 100 years ago, almost exactly 100 years ago, um, when he was thinking about vacuum tube diodes. And so the idea is that uh, if I have electrons that are Poisson distributed in time, so there's some average arrival rate for electrons, but this one doesn't know when the last one came, and it doesn't know when the next one's coming, uh, then I can figure out what the spectrum of the current fluctuations is. And it ends up being white out to some quite high frequency cutoff. Um, and uh, the, uh, the uh, magnitude of the current fluctuations per unit bandwidth is twice the electronic charge times the average current. That's the Poisson uncorrelated case. Now, what do people really measure in real experiments in different situations? They measure something called the, they measure the real, the real fluctuations. And the ratio between the, real, the measured fluctuations and the uh, Poisson result is called the Fano factor, because Ugi Fano had his name on all kinds of things. Um, so you could imagine doing something exotic. You could imagine if I've got str a strange metal, if charge, if everything was sort of hydrodynamic and charge was, was it, it, you got to be very careful with statements like this. But it, you know, if, if basically there weren't well-defined quasi-particles at all, you could imagine a scenario within the system anyway where um, you might find that the that that that, uh, that the Fano factor was zero. If, char if these things were sort of continuous, you might imagine that you'd find the Fano factor to be zero. Um, if you had a situation where you had pairs, no coherence necessarily, maybe not a superconductor, but you've got pairs lying around, and you 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 had tr your, whatever your system was, it was being traversed by pairs. You might imagine having a doubled um, a doubled shot noise because your effective charge of your charge carriers would be two e, right? And then, of course, there's always a possibility that maybe 
you know, the strange metal is really just some sort of, uh, we'll call this the Laughlin idea, that maybe there's no such thing as strange metals and they're really just messed up looking Fermi liquids and, and that everything's totally conventional. Right? You have to be very careful how you do this. Um, people have used shot noise to look at, at, at changes in the effect of charge before. So here's, a, here's an example of a paper from a while ago uh, with a, a little, uh, here's a niobium electrode, here's a copper normal metal electrode, here's a little diffusive copper bridge. And uh, there's a, an expectation of what the shot noise should be if this is all conventional, right? And so, so uh, if you go, uh, if you, they, I left out the figure where if you're above TC, the shot noise looks completely boring. If you're a little bit below TC, the shot noise, this is, this is the charge E limit, and this is the 2E limit. If you're a little bit below TC, you're somewhere in between with the idea that somehow you're getting some amount of pairs going through, some kind of Andreev process. And if you keep going below TC, uh, at some point you really see this doubled shot noise, right? And then it's sufficiently high bias where the bias is kind of comparable to the superconducting gap. Now maybe you're breaking pairs and you're getting some, some, some uh, quasi-particles going in as well, right? Um, so that's kind of cute. The other, the, the more famous example of this is, um, uh, this is from the, the well, this is, this is from the Nature paper from DiPicciato et al., uh, and this is from the PRL by the Saclay group. Um, but this is looking at noise in the fractional quantum Hall system, right? So I'm going to get, I'm going to tunnel from one edge to another edge of a fractional quantum Hall state, and I'm going to tunnel through the correlated gapped nu equals a third quantum Hall state that can support exotic quasiparticles, right? And when you do that, what you find, in fact, is evidence. You know, these papers were both cited in the Nobel citation for the fractional quantum Hall effect because they show evidence of fractional charge, is the argument, right? They get shot noise that looks like uh, the, the, you, know, you, you get a final factor of a third in the tunneling. And so you can argue that maybe for some bizarre reason you get a final factor of a third, or you could say that the quasi particles that are tunneling have charge of 30, e, right? And subsequently, particularly um, uh, the, um, the high bloop group in Israel has done a lot of beautiful work uh, looking at other fractions and seeing you know, other things. You can, you can work in condo systems and see, and see fractional charge under certain circumstances in those systems as well. So what happens if you play with a strange metal? So again, you know, here's an example of a strange metal from a review article by Keimer et al. Um, you can take a cuprate, right? There's a big, uh, you know, these are, these are an example of a material system where um, Here's, for example, uh, lanthanum strontium copper oxide, right? Actually, the doping seems a little bit off for the numbers for LSCO, but this is plotted in a kind of a peculiar way. But what you're looking at is the resistivity is some residual resistivity plus some temperature-dependent part. And the exponent n here uh, is very close to 1 when you're kind of in this strange metal regime, right? So it would be very interesting to look at a system like this. Can uh, tunneling shot noise tell us something about, first of all, whether there are quasi-particles in this strange metal phase. Can it tell us about whether there's pairing above TC? Um, this kind of thing. Right. So what's the system we're trying to look at? Um, Professor Hoffman, you'll appreciate because you're a co-author on a paper with Bozovich about, about looking at what happens if you take these materials and you try and pattern them with a fib. Um, uh, we, uh, we are looking at devices that, are, that were, my student spent, um, uh, spent last summer at Brookhaven, Pan Pan spent last summer at Brookhaven, working with uh, the Bozovich group. Um, and uh, Tony Bollinger uh, is an amazing person too. Uh, and they were growing these epitaxial uh, tunneling structures, vertical tunneling structures. This is something that actually Bozovich had worked on a long time ago, um, trying to look at if I take LSCO and I have a, like, you know, how many unit cells of LCO do I need to basically kill the Josephson effect, right? How, you know, how, how, much, how, much, doped, how much undoped MOT insulator do I need between doped MOT insulators to kill uh, the superconducting contact between the top and the bottom? So these are these samples. Um, you know, they're, they're made with a somewhat laborious fabrication process. The actual area of the tunnel junctions is kind of a few, you know, imagine a semicircle, kind of a few microns in diameter, depending on how, on how we do this. So these are fairly large area things. So we're looking at noise, and I know there are a bunch of people in this room who, uh, and probably watching on YouTube, um, who have done noise measurements before. There's a couple of different ways you can do this. Um, we've done some radio frequency approaches where you can do a lock-in sort of thing, where you turn the noise on, you can turn the, the, the bias on and off, 
And you can use a lock-in to see the change in the integrated RF power coming out of your device, synchronous with you turning the BIOS on and off. That's one way to get the noise. Um, you can also just do cross-correlations, where you can basically just take two amplifiers and look at the voltage fluctuations across your device. And you use two amplifiers because the idea is that the amplifier noise between the two amplifiers is supposed to be uncorrelated. So if you take the two amplifiers and you cross-correlate them, you should get rid of the amplifier noise and be left with the intrinsic noise in the device, right? Um, this is something that I know is done in like the undergrad, the advanced undergrad lab here, right? For when you do a lab on shot noise and Johnson noise, and I know it's, it's in there. Um, same basic idea. So as a proof of concept to show that we know what we're doing, um, we made some gold HBN gold devices. That's what this paper is about. Um, just, you know, long story short, uh, they work. Okay, so, so this is, a, this is the, uh, the current noise versus the properly scaled bias. All the different temperatures just lie on there very nicely. You can use this for thermometry. Um, what you find in these structures is the Fano factor is basically one. Uh, this, this was done with the RF technique, actually. It turns out we've now discovered that there are some problems with using the RF technique on the superconductors that we didn't anticipate. I'm happy to talk about those if you want. Um, we've sort of switched more to doing the lower frequency technique, the uh, lower bandwidth technique, um, the cross-correlation approach on the superconductors. But the, the, the bottom line is you can, you, know, you can do these things. You kind of know what the shape is supposed to look like. Um, now, these devices, the, the gold HBN gold ones, were very ohmic. They're, they're really, they really, you know, the differential resistance is pretty boring uh, as a function of bias. And so um, this just looks like... Uh, scaled variable, hyperbolic cotangent scaled variable minus one, and it really fits. In general, if you have a non-omic system, right, you got to be careful about how you do this. So at each bias, you can worry about what the differential resistance is. And so this is sort of what you expect to see if you plot things versus voltage uh, for a non-omic system. Um, so let me give you just an example, a flavor of what we're seeing. So here's resistance versus temperature for one of these uh, zero bias resistance versus temperature for one of the differential resistance for one of these um, junctions, optimally doped, uh, optimal doping for these sides. Um, and, you know, it never looks metallic, okay? It always looks kind of, kind of insulating. And when you get below TC, which is about 38 Kelvin, uh, the resistance really goes up. And that's because you're gapping out the quasi-particles, right? So, so as you, you know, j just if you, have a, if you have an SIS junction, when you go through, and, it's, and you're not getting the Josephson effect, when you go through TC, the resistance should go up. Yes, yes, exactly. Vertical conduction, tunneling regime. And here's, you know, you can, you can measure, this is an early measurement. Um, I'm not even sure it's on this exact sample. This is an early measurement of uh, just the, you know, kind of the tunneling uh, DI, DIDV, the tunneling conductance as a function of bias. It flip it over and you have a peak in the differential resistance, right? Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's kind of the story there. No, it is asymmetric. Um, these devices really do seem to be asymmetric. The, the bottom LSCO layer is thicker than the top LSCO layer. And there seems to be some issue. So basically, if you've got charge flowing out of the thick layer, out of the thick side, you tend to get higher differential conductance. That just seems to be a systematic of these structures. It's got some, not entirely sure what that is. Um, okay, so... Let me show you a, a basically a, you know, like a flip book style thing here. Um, so here we have differential resistance versus current. All right, and here we are way above TC. And this is, we're in a small bias range. We're, we're you know, pretty low bias actually on the scale of these things. Here's uh, the, um, the current noise versus the current. And here's the uh, current noise versus the voltage. And I should point out, it's a little hard to see, the lower curve, the, red, the thin red curve, is using this expression, right? So if I take the assume that for the red curve, I assume that, that E is just E, that there's just the effective charge is just one electron. Looks pretty nice, right? This would be if the effective charge was two electrons. Okay. Now, um, I should also point out that the, the reason I'm showing this plot versus the voltage, so at zero bias, the, the, the thermal noise is correct. Okay, you really do get the, the top the temperature. All right, so 75K, it's getting a little more non-omic. Uh, 65, 50. One thing to point out, um, really get from that equation I showed you for the single, for purely single electron tunneling. So this is the big thing where 
um, we, we need to figure out if that's real. Right? We're at the stage now where it's interesting and we've seen it multiple times, but I'm still not convinced it's real. So we're trying to, trying to figure that out. Um, but uh, you know, 45, remember TC is about 38, right? Um, 42, 38, so we're right around TC. And we're a little bit below TC now. Notice there's kind of a little bit of an inflection in here. Um, and this is, you know, this is poking up a bit. Um, if we keep going down, you see pretty clearly, you, know, you really do see some enhanced noise at low bias. And the, 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 so just for a sense of scale, the superconducting gap would show up on here as about plus or minus five or six millivolts. Right? Um, and again, here you can really see versus current, this is the, this is, this is, these, aren't, these aren't fits. This is just two, this is basically uh, two EI and four EI, right? the lines. Um, and here we are at 28 Kelvin, and you really clearly see that you're seeing, you're seeing what looks like uh, pair tunneling. Even though you're in this limit where you're not getting Josephson effect, you're getting some kind of pair tunneling here. Um, keep going. Now things get pretty weird. So here we are at like 20 Kelvin, and there's clearly some really non-monotonic thing going on down here where the noise is much higher at low bias than you'd expect uh, just for um, tunneling pairs. So it suggests there's some kind of maybe, maybe other higher order Andrea of things are going on. Like I said, this is all very preliminary. So I feel a little weird sh showing this on YouTube, but we're, we're trying to understand it. Um, it's quite dramatic, right? 15 Kelvin, it's really, you know, there's really some funky things going on here. Now, and again, like, you know, the gap is basically, is basically here. Um, so uh, just to show we can take this on a larger bias scale too, and these things do overlap pretty well. Um, here again, here we are at you know, 25K and the, the small bias data and the large bias data overlap. And again, you can really see um, even you know, at high bias, there's really a, this stuff really does lie above the simple uh, curve that you'd naively expect, right? Um, 15K, right? So you know, this is, this is kind of where we are. Um, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been a lot of, of fun so far. I think, I hope that you know, in some not terribly long period of time, we will have looked at a lot more devices, and we will have a lot, uh, been able to analyze this in some interesting way. One of, one of the really interesting things is whether you really are, you know, does this imply that there is some level of enhanced pairing going on even at high biases, and does this, and, you know, this is actually even there a, a, a fair bit above TC, right? If, if this is real. I mean, there's always the possibility that this is an instrumental artifact, and so we're really, really trying to figure that out. Um, so let me just wrap up. Uh, you know, I hope I've, I've demonstrated, oh, I've got, I'm not sure why that was delayed. This is just a random picture of a cool, uh, this is vanadium dioxide thin crystal with some very, over some very closely spaced contacts. Um, I hope I've convinced you that uh, nanostructures are an interesting way, you know, nanostructured devices are an interesting way of examining materials with strong correlations. I've shown you sort of three examples where we can learn different things uh, uh, from studying the physics of these things. Um, I think our investigations of magnetic materials have suggested that there can be some previously unseen things going on in those systems that are worth further investigation. Uh, and like I said, we're working, you know, we're working kind of on a big picture question, something that's been interested in me for a long time, which is really how should I think about the long-lived, low-energy excitations of these things that may not really be fermiliquids? What's the right way to think about them? Are they really just, you know, quasi-particles of some different flavor? Or are they much more exotic? Um, I hope we are able to figure this out. And with that, uh, I put this back up, and I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you. That's the total current. But, no, that, but you're showing so, noise. I'm showing, sorry, I'm showing, is yeah. Is noise divided by total current? No, it's not, well, let me make sure I get the units right. It's, it's, no, it's, 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 it's noise per unit bandwidth, right? So it's, it's, uh, it's um, the units are amp squared per hertz, right? So we. Right, but you have, if you plotted just IV over that range, what would yes. it be? Uh, if I plotted IV, it, well, so here's the differential resistance over that range. So what you're going to find is that the, is that the, um, the uh, there's a big zero bias suppression of the conduction, and then it's going to, well, I guess 
going to kind of look like that. Um, but when we when we when we when we talk about when we talk about like if this line if I say that that line is two ei, I'm using the total current. Okay, so it yeah. is reference to the reference to total current. current. Yes, and we do I do worry a little bit about whether you know if there were defects in the tunnel in the tunnel structures. So suppose all the tunneling was going through some tiny tiny region where there's a thin spot or something. I worry a little bit about you know you can have funny inhomogeneous things where. Um, I've got stuff that we're trying to, we're trying to write up now where uh, you can get defect-mediated tunneling and say, if I take HBN and I abuse it, um, you can have a situation where you can get, you, where, where you can see funny things happening in the noise that you have a, an idea are not reflective of the total current flowing through the whole device, but of some like defect site that's doing something strange. So that's you know, it's a good point. You have to worry about you know, how you're normalizing this. Yes. How did you tune the uh, RICO tunnel contact? Like, what did you optimize for? Uh, uh -huh. So why not make, for example, a very reflection transparent? Transparent. So why not make it very transparent? So, so the, the short answer is that that we wanted to. Um, so the yeah the question is how do we optimize the the, the thickness of the tunnel barrier basically right? So uh, so I kind of left this in the hands of uh, of, of my collaborator. Uh, so what, what he, you know, I, I know that if you want to get a good, a high, what we were mostly interested in initially was just making sure that we actually got devices that weren't shorted through, right? So we wanted to make, we were, so the plan in the longer term is to work on thinner things. But we started off with, you know, three unit cells thick. Seems to be very robust. You can make these fairly large area tunnel junctions where you don't have any pinholes, you don't have any weird defects. Um, so that was kind of it. I mean, it's a very interesting question if we made more transparent structures. What would you see? But I should say that he's—they've done the experiment where, oh, sorry, LCO is the tunnel barrier. They do not see uh, Josephson current. So they've got a Nature paper from 2003 where they argue that like one unit cell thick of LCO is enough to kill uh, the Josephson tunneling. You should see—I I think you should see Andreev stuff like crazy there that just isn't—you know—somehow you're you're somehow you're um, well. I need to think carefully about the relationship between these kinds of processes and what actually gives you the Josephson effect. I'm not, historically, I'm not a superconductivity guy, so I want to be very careful about what I say about superconductivity. Any other questions? If not, let's thank the speaker once more. Thank you.